destruction of Jerusalem at the hands of Nebuchadnezzar II, king of Babylon, in the year 586 BCE, shook the Jewish people to their core. The temple burned. Tens of thousands were killed. And Jerusalem, the kingdom's capital for over 400 years, was razed to the ground. Those who survived the horrors of war were driven out on a long, grueling march to Babylon. Many would not survive the journey. At the end of the journey, on the banks of the river Euphrates, a lament of grief and longing bursts out among the exiles. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Also, we wept as we remembered Zion. In the midst of this calamity comes a message of hope from Jerusalem. The prophet Jeremiah urges the exiles to rebuild their lives in Babylon, build houses and dwell in them, and plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. For thus said the Lord, after 70 years in Babylon, I will visit you and fulfill my good word to you by returning you to this place. Indeed, the Jews embrace Babylonian customs and language, engage in farming and commerce, and acquire wealth and status. As the Jews thrive in Babylon, their ties to the land of Israel grow weaker. Here, look at these documents at the Bible Lands Museum. These are receipts and documents that belong to the exiled Jews. They were written in the Babylonian language 2,600 years ago. These documents include Hebrew names like Haggai, Joshua, Achikam, and Netanyahu. But there are also Babylonian names that the exiles adopted from their new neighbors. Is this what these tablets are telling us? That the Jewish people were assimilating and were about to vanish like many other nations? Apparently not. Surprisingly, Jewish identity actually strengthened during the exile. The Jews kept the Sabbath and the laws of the Torah. They formed strong communities that remained separate from those of their non-Jewish neighbors. However, as time went by, the dream of returning to Jerusalem became more and more distant. The Babylonian kings treated minorities ruthlessly. Under their rule, the Jews would never have a chance to go back to the land of Israel. But wait, it appears that the harsh regime is about to come to an end. In 539 BCE, the mighty army of Cyrus the Great, king of Persia and Medea, conquered Babylon. Upon marching triumphantly into the city, King Cyrus made an unprecedented gesture that would forever change the fate of the ancient world. Cyrus declared jubilantly that all nations, including the Jews, were now permitted to return to their homelands and rebuild their temples. Until 1879 CE, the world only knew of this important decree thanks to the Bible. That year, a remarkable discovery was made in the ruins of Babylon. A small clay cylinder with an inscription in the Babylonian language in Akkadian script. When it was deciphered, the scholars were astonished. It was an authentic 2,600-year-old copy of the Edict of Cyrus. Despite differences between the biblical text and the inscription on the cylinder, the scholars concluded that in fact both texts refer to the same proclamation. It seems Cyrus issued several versions of the edict, each one adapted to the nation's specific language and beliefs. The Hebrew version of the edict of Cyrus appears in the book of Ezra. Thus said Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord, God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth, and he has charged me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever is among you of all his people, may his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord, God of Israel, he is God, which is in Jerusalem. The Jews were exhilarated by the Edict of Cyrus. The land of Israel was once again accessible. The return to Zion began. Filled with hope, fervor, and excitement, the captives stepped into a new, glorious era for the Jewish people. The return to Zion and the Second Temple period.
Amen. 